All right, well, we're really excited to have Kathleen Trafford here today, who's a member of our library board. Um, and this was her program that she asked to do, which I always like when people offer their programs and I don't have to go begging. So <laughs> <laughs> we are very excited and I will let you take it away. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Um, I'm actually excited to do this. I, I did it once before at the, the Bar Association. Hey, Jeff. And um, I've updated a little bit since then. But I was lucky enough to chair the task force of the American College of Trial Lawyers on Judicial Independence um, in 2018. And it was quite an exciting learning experience because I knew, I thought I knew about judicial independence, but to really dive into it was, was really a, a fascinating undertaking. So what I'm gonna do today, you have a copy of the college's white paper on judicial independence, um, which is your handout. I would, however, encourage you if you want to read it online because what we've done is we've hyperlinked in all the original sources that we rely on in the white paper. So if you read it online and you're interested in what is being said, you can just hit the hyperlink and you get to the original source. And there's some fun stuff in there including some videos. So. And I should mention Judge Fry is now a member of the college's task or um, general committee on judicial independence. So he can come next time and tell you even more than what I can tell you today. But to start, um, let's start with talking about you know what judicial independence really is because it sometimes gets very misused when it's talked about um, in some segments of the, uh, the both the, the bar as well as the public where it's given a negative connotation to be like judicial activism or judicial arrogance or judges not being accountable. And that's really completely false. That's not at all what the essence of judicial independence is. So let's take a, a look at some of um, what I think are captured the real essence of judicial independence. Um, in the college material, we talk about it as judges should decide cases faithful to the law without fear or favor and free from political or external pressures. Um, we've had some of the um, justices of the Supreme Court talk about it very eloquently. You see there the, um, the comment from Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who's a very strong advocate of judicial independence and has um, actually produced an Emmy winning award. It's a little video she put together um, sponsored by the National Association of Women Judges where she talks about judicial independence in a public education um, context. Very, very well done. Um, you have Chief Justice Rehnquist, um, I like his in particular. Federal judge steps out of the proper judicial role when he or she flinches from a decision that is legally right because it's not one that's the home crowd wants. And then we have the very recent um, comment from um, Chief Justice Roberts, the judges don't speak for the people, but we speak for the Constitution. And here's an example <coughs> of how you can use the white paper if you're on the, the website. If you go, I think it's on page two of the white paper, it refers to this comment by Chief Justice Roberts. If you click on the link, you can actually see the video of his presentation at the University of um, Minnesota in October of 2018 and actually see his comments. Um, so really, I think what all these different quotes boil down to and what they mean just in plain terms is that judges are to be fair and impartial and imply the rule of law um, without fear of popular opinion. And unlike the legislative or the executive branches, the judicial branch was never intended to be a representative of the people. It was intended to be independent and really to represent the Constitution and the rule of law. Um, Justice O'Connor has another good capture in terms of what it means. It says judicial independence does not happen all by itself. It's tremendously hard to create and easier than most people think to destroy. So that's what we're gonna look at today is some of the ways that um, judicial independence is being threatened in our society today. First, let me say this as the, the caveat. It's perfectly fine to disagree with a judicial opinion. Not everybody's gonna agree with every decision that um, a judge authors. 
um, and it's our right under the Constitution and it really goes to the strength of our democracy that we can disagree with what a judge um, decides in a particular case but it's how we um, there's handouts here if you want them um, it's how we express the disagreement that becomes so crucial and so oops, I knew I would do that So here are the examples of some of the um, ways that judicial independence becomes threatened um, when we kind of cross the line from you know, fair comment and criticism on a judge's opinion <laughs> to really being a threat to judicial independence. And that would include things like the unfair personal attacks on a judge for an unpopular opinion, um, threats to impeachment or recall because of a popular disagreement with a perfectly lawful decision. Um, something we know firsthand here in Ohio, negative campaign ads that undermine the um, integrity of the judiciary, and even legislative proposals that seek to limit the rightful role of the judiciary. So this is kind of the, the global um, setting for all the different threats that we can see. Um, and let's take a look at some of the more um, current, um, or what we call the modern day assaults. Um, certainly, um, you know, comments about judges and judicial opinions, I mean, it goes back to the dawn of the Republic. Um, we've seen examples. Um, it was Thomas Jefferson when he was president. He and the Democratic, Democratic Republicans at the time um, um, took on the Chief Justice um, Chase of the Supreme Court based upon um, disagreement with the opinions that was coming out of the court at that time. This is back in the 18th century. And even threatened to have, you know, the judge peach because of um, the unpopularity of some of his decisions. So this really isn't anything new, but I think in today's era it's taken on a, a new um, level of concern based upon the volume and the types of discourse we have. Um, some of the judges, in fact, it was one of the district judges in New York, kind of pocketed 1996 as the, the watershed year of the beginning of the modern day assaults. And it was through a series of decisions coming out of the courts in, in New York that were viewed popularly as putting the judges in the position of being soft on crime and very, very caustic criticisms of these decisions, including that they were mindless and you know junk justice and idiotic decisions. And one in particular that kind of started this was a case in 1996, United States versus Bayless. And it was Judge Howard Baer of the District Court, Southern District of New York, who issued a decision that um, allowed um, an alleged drug trafficker to go free, even though she possessed like 80 pounds of cocaine. And his decision was based upon the fact that the prosecution hadn't really established that it was a lawful search and seizure. And that just caused an uproar, not only in New York, but spread all the way to the Capitol. And you had um, both President Clinton weigh in on it because the judge was a Clinton appointee. And so people were being very critical of Clinton for having appointed this activist judge who was running a muck up there in New York. And of course, it was an election year. Um, Senator Dole, who was running against Clinton at the time, started a petition to call for the removal of the judge based upon his decisions. Um, it didn't happen, but a very, very um, stark example of a threat to judicial independence in, in recent times. Um, most of us also will remember, I'm sorry, I'm back. <coughs> Operator error again. Um, the Sherry Avo decisions down in Florida caused um, consternation both at the state level and also at the federal level. Um, state court judges were um, criticized daily for the decisions they were making in that case. And it rose to the level where Congress decided that they would federalize the decision. Um, federal, actually take federal jurisdictions over questions of you know, life support to, for terminal um, patients. Never, never part of the federal jurisprudence. But Congress decided that was the only way to kind of rein in these um, crazy state court judges. Well, then when the federal court judges refused to act, um, knowing it was not part of their jurisdiction, the congressional leaders called for their impeachment. Um, 
and it was led by um, um, Speaker of the House um, Delay at the time. And here's some of his comments. Um, he called them, this is an arrogant, out of control judiciary. This is the judiciary at the federal level who refused to step into the case. Um, one of the House speakers, um, spokesmen for the House, came out with a statement, until we have a court that reflects the majority, it's a sick and sad joke that we have a constitution at all. Another comment was, we set up the courts, we can unset the courts, we have the power of the purse. Very direct the threats at the um, federal judiciary for not stepping in um, and doing what the Congress or the popular view was at the time. So what happened as a result of some of these cases? Well, back in, primarily in 2006, it caused a firestorm in the, the bar, the professional organizations, that we have to step up and defend the judiciary, because look at what's happening. Um, so that was the first time the college published its first white paper on judicial independence was in 2006. Um, but we also had the ABA, Defending Justice, or Justice at Stake program, where they set out to educate the public about how important it was that we um, defend the judiciary and how important judicial independence was. The College of Trial Lawyers did the same thing with their white paper and very um, quick responses whenever they saw threats to um, judicial independence. The Brennan Center for Justice, and you'll see um, links to the Brennan Center throughout the white paper because it's a very, um, very scholarly work that they do in all aspects of judiciary, um, but particularly judicial independence. Um, you had the Defense Research Institute also weighing in. Um, the Institute for the American Legal System. Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System. Thank you, Judge, I knew you would know the answer. Um, the Judicar Society. All these very um, prestigious professional organizations jumped on the bandwagon in 2006 and the years right after that to try to mobilize the, the bar and to educate the public of how important the judiciary is and why it's different than the other branches of government. And it's not supposed to just speak for the popular viewpoints. Um, so when we started this project in 2018, the, the college president said, we should take a look back at the uh, previous decade and see what did all these efforts do? Did we really advance the needle in terms of defending and promoting judicial independence by all these efforts over the past decade? And as a result of that, not coming up, there it is. What did we find? If you look back at what's been happening um, since the, the watershed years of 2006 and later, the threats continue and they've been escalating. Um, they're much more prevalent than they were even in 2006 and they emanate from even the highest sources. I thought this was a chilling statistic. That nine out of 10 judges think um, independence is threatened. I don't know if we'll take a vote in the room, but um, I hear that comment. Um, as part of our work in terms of um, developing the white paper in 2018, we did a survey of judges across the country, state court and federal court, and asked them that same question. And we got a similar response. I mean, there was a very concern that they were aware of the threats um, um, from all different angles um, to judicial independence. But here are some examples of some of the ways that we're seeing the, the threats to judicial independence in, in modern times. Um, the false and misleading media reports, um, social media attacks, and we're going to talk about those. Um, recall elections prompted by unpopular decisions negative campaigning and legislative assaults as well. So these are kind of all the arrows that are coming at the judiciary um, in the current time. Now I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but we have to talk. You can't talk about what's being said about the judiciary without talking about um, some of the president's comments. Um, it started with a comment with, remember, the um, judge in, in born in Indiana 
still in Indiana, um, who had the case against Trump um, University. And when the, the judge ruled against the Tr Trump University in that case, the response was, well, he was a Mexican. He was a Trump hater. Um, he was just, you know, acting as an activist judge because he hated Donald Trump. Called his decisions total disgrace. Um, and this is being done, of course, on social media, which gets widespread um, reception around the, the public. Then we had the situation of Judge Robart out in California. Judge Robart was the one um, first judge to rule on the um, Muslim ban on immigration and ruled against President Trump. And he was referred to as the so-called so -called judge, um, not a real judge, so-called unelected judge. And this is important that we hear that come up, not just from the president, but from other sources unelected judges, which is a euphemism for these are judges that aren't representing the majority view of the people in their mind. Well, that's the whole point of the judiciary. It's not to be representative of the people. It's to be representative of the Constitution and the rule of law. Then we had Judge Oreck. Um, he was the judge that ruled against the administration's ban on funding for sanctuary cities referred to as an egregious overreach by an unelected judge. Same, same connotation that somehow because he was unelected, he wasn't representing the popular view. Then we also had the um, judge in California, also in Northern California, um, who was ruling, I think it was the, one of the uh, um, asylum cases, and he was the one referred to as, he's an Obama judge, so of course he would rule against against the administration. Um, I mean, these kind of comments, um, I mean, have real significance. Um, Ju Judge Robard spoke this past week at the ABA convention out in San Francisco, and he said that um, as a result of some of the comments that were directed against him based upon his ruling, including this one, where the president said that it was Judge Robard who put our country at peril. If something happens, blame him and the court system. Well, this prompted um, some very serious threats against Judge Robart. Um, people put up his home address, his wife's um, business address up on the internet. They received over 42,000 calls, letters, and emails um, complaining about his decision and threatening him in some way. The United States Marshals out there in California considered at least 1,100 of those threats to be actually um, serious, significant threats against his life and safety, including 100 death threats. So this kind of talk out there, you know, does have real consequences um, for the judge. Um, you, know, um, you probably recall back, um, particularly this one with, the, with against Judge Tijar, um, came right around the, the end of the year in 2018, and it prompted a very unusual, uncharacteristic response from Chief Justice Roberts as well. Um, his response, it was um, on Thanksgiving Day. He was stopped by a reporter and asked to, to comment on it, and he had this to say, we don't have Obama judges or Trump judges. We don't have Bush judges or Clinton judges. What we have is an extraordinary group of dedicated judges doing their level best to do equal right to those appearing before them. The judiciary is something we should all be thankful for. Very unprecedented um, outspoken comment by the Chief Justice, who himself had been subject to very strong criticism, um, but didn't speak out. But this time, it really did set off a, uh, an alarm in his, in his mind. And again, I don't mean to pick on the president, um, you know, I'm sure there's people who are, agree with them and are strong supporters, but in this narrow context, I think we have to agree that this kind of conversation about our judiciary is, is less than helpful and can be actually very, very dangerous. Um, I get the website on the bottom, and it's also in the, in the white paper itself, you can actually go, and the Brennan Center has a, an ongoing compilation of some of these kind of comments. Um, these kind of social media attacks on, on the judiciary. Um, that's not to say, you know, presidents don't have a right to criticize the judges. Um, 
it's it's more a question of how you criticize them and what could be the consequences I've got a couple examples I can share with you of other judges um, who have also disagreed um, President um, President Nixon, for example, was a very strong opponent of busing for school desegregation purposes. Very, very strong opponent, and was very disappointed um, when the Supreme Court ruled that busing was a perfectly legitimate um, means, constitutional means, of, seg of desegregating the schools. This was President Nixon's comment um, after that decision in Swain versus Charlotte Mecklenburg came out said I expressed views I expressed views with regard to my opposition to busing for purposes of, of achieving racial balance and in support of neighborhood school in my statement last March now that the Supreme Court has spoken on that issue whatever I've said before is inconsistent is inconsistent with the Supreme Court's decision and is now moot and irrelevant because everybody in this country including the President of the United States is under the law you can disagree and do it forcefully, but do it in a way that doesn't cause this kind of consternation um, we're seeing now. Um, I think I have another example. President Bush had his own disagreement with the Supreme Court. This was on the um, rights of the detainees in um, Gitmo. And when the Supreme Court ruled against the, the Bush administration's policy in terms of, I'm sorry. Bush one or two? Um, this was Bush two, Bush two. Um, when the Supreme Court ruled against his policies in terms of giving more civil rights to the detainees, um, the President had this to say, we'll abide, we'll abide by the court's decision. That doesn't mean I have to agree with it. It's a deeply divided court and I strongly agree with those who dissented. Perfectly fair comment disagreeing with the, the court's um, decisions, but doing it in a way that doesn't undermine really the integrity of the court and this this is part of the concern we're seeing and again I'm not limiting this to the current president but these kind of um, you know attacks that we're seeing through social media in particular are, are of great concern because there's no opportunity there's no context they just come out as you know bullet blasts and there's no opportunity for the public to see the other side in, in a balanced presentation of this um, so that, that's what's so disconcerting, is not only the possible chilling effect it could have on the judiciary, but what effect it has on the public mm -hmm. in terms of their perception of the court. Because here when you have presidents, you also have legal scholars. You have the talking heads on you know, the nightly news that can be very critical. It, tells, it sends a message to the public that's um, undermines, I think, the respect for the judiciary. And, and that's the source of the concern. Let me give you a different set of examples. Pardon my technical. There we go. Another thing we're seeing, and this is relatively new, um, yes, we saw it back with, with um, the President and Justice Chase, but we're seeing more and more of these impeachment and recall attempts. So for example, in, in 2010, there was an actual voter recall of three Iowa ju justices for their decision upholding gay marriage. Um, now, of course, we all know roll forward, the Supreme Court did agree with that decision, so that is now the law of the land. But let me say this at first as a caveat, there's nothing wrong with voter recall. I mean, if the voters are the ones doing, the, they're elected judges and the voters recall, you know, that's their right under their state constitutions to do that. But what's disconcerting is there, where there's a recall because of an unpopular decision, an isolated one decision that goes against the majority public view of what should be right in a judge who may have a stellar career um, of, of very good judging gets recalled for one unpopular decision and that's the difference while the people have that right we don't take that away at all um, it's, it's unfortunate to see that happen 
because of the popular disagreement with one decision. We saw it in 2011 was a big year for impeachment threats. We saw them in Iowa, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Oklahoma. Again, the same pattern, some popular disagreement with a single decision, whether it was redistricting or gay marriage or funding for public schools, these kind of hot button issues really do trigger this kind of response. In 2018, we had a California trial judge recalled for a sentencing decision. Again, this was a very unpopular decision. This was, it was the Stanford swimmer who was accused of sexually assaulting a, a woman on campus. And I got a fairly lenient sentence. But it was a lenient sentence that was actually recommended by the probation department or the people who recommend sentencing, um, but very, very unpopular. And the, the judge was recalled as a, as a result of that. Curiously enough, the, the prosecutor, who of course was vehemently opposed to the lenient sentence, um, actually wrote an editorial supporting the judge and saying he shouldn't be re recalled simply because of that one decision. That judge is now working from his home, kind of like a night court judge, um, which is unfortunate. In 2018, we had the impeachment legislation against five Pennsylvania Supreme Court justices over their decision on redistricting. Um, and that, I think, is still, um, th that controversy is still going on, although the judges were not impeached. Um, we had an impeachment petition against a Massachusetts trial judge um, for, a for a probation decision in an immigration case on drug dealing. Now, these impeachment bills don't often um, have success, but the mere fact that they're there, that they're introduced by the legislative branch to respond to an unpopular decision by a judge, that's what is the cause for concern. And I think that's a little bit different than the voter recall. Um, in some ways, it's the more serious um, threat, I think, when it's coming from the legislatures, many of whom are lawyers and should um, really understand the difference between the three branches of government. We also what um, called court curbing bills. Um, the Brennan Center reported in 2018, 16 states had introduced 46 different court curbing bills. And what do these bills do? They, they seek to punish judges for decisions they're making, whether a single judge or, or um, you know, a majority of the court. They tend to be um, directed more at the appellate branches than the trial courts. Um, but what they do is they interject greater pol politics into the judicial selection. Um, uh, for example, one of these bills um, made it, you had to be on a list provided by the legislature before you could be appointed by the governor to the court. Um, completely cutting out what had been the process where there was a judicial selection commission that the, the bar put together. Um, um, bills to make it easier to remove judges for unpopular decisions. Um, bills to cut judicial resources in order to punish judges. Um, uh, there was one where they um, withheld the uh, pension for the judges because they were um, disappointed in a decision and they said, we're not going to fund your pension until you overrule yourself. Um, there was another one where they cut the court's budget. Um, one, this was interesting, the, the court um, banned guns in the courthouse and so the legislature said because until you allow guns in the courthouse we're going to charge you rent for using the courthouse and you're going to have to pay some fine for security and all, all the expense that goes with this um, another way they do that is to shorten judicial terms um, to you know take out unpopular judges um, shorten the terms so they can get rid of them quicker um, some even go so far as to restrict the power to find laws unconstitutional. Um, one state had in, introduced legislation that allowed a decision from the Supreme Court declaring a law unconstitutional to be overridden by a two-thirds vote of the legislature. <coughs> the legislature could have decide what the Constitution says. Um, I had some more examples. 
There was one I saw, I just saw it this morning, um, which was something a little bit different twist on this. It was reported on the news this morning that um, some of the Democratic senators have filed an amicus brief in the Supreme Court who is set to decide um, a Second Amendment case. And um, the, the, the substance of the brief is that the court should not decide it because it's moot and they shouldn't weigh in on this kind of reach out to decide something that didn't need to be decided. That's perfectly fine and those amicus briefs are great. This one's a little bit troubling because according to the news, and I only had a chance to look at the brief very quickly, there is a, a statement right at the end of the brief to the effect that the court is not well and based upon a Quinnipiac um, poll, the majority believe that there is support for restructuring the court. And if the court doesn't timely heal itself, maybe we'll restructure. I mean, that's a, a pretty, <laughs> Um, not too subtle threat on judicial independence. Um, signed by <coughs> any number of, of senators, I think there was five or six senators who signed on to this amicus brief. Um, but you're starting to hear that same kind of talk in some of the um, campaign debates for the presidential race, you know, um, particularly where there's candidates running who are, you know, opposed to the NRA position. They are suggesting that you know, the court has a role in this because of the, the influence by the NRA, um, the Federalist Society, the conservative elements who have put um, or lobbied to put more conservative justices on the court. So that's even coming out in the, in the campaigns now. Um, and again, that, see, it can go both sides of the political aisle. It's not one side or the other that's um, responsible for this. And, and th these kind of threats do have real consequences. Um, this is a quote from a, it's actually a Supreme Court case before all of us were born. Um, Judges are supposed to be men and women of fortitude, able to thrive in a hearty climate and not sensitive to the winds of public opinion. And that, you know, that's a good aspiration. You know, we want our judges to be stalwart and we want them to make decisions without fear or favor. But you know, it, in this environment sometimes, because of these external pressures, it can be hard. Um, here's a, a qu quote, um, Judge Otto Klaus, he was a um, judge out in California, and I want to get his, his quote right. It's the crocodile in the bathtub syndrome, and I apologize to the ladies in the audience because it's a very sexist kind of comment, but you get the drift, or we could substitute, but um, we should keep it true to his quote. He said, deciding a controversial case while facing re-election is like finding a crocodile in your bathtub when you go to shave. You know it's there and you try really hard not to think about it, but it's hard to think about anything else while you're shaving. So that's, that's a very personal, very dramatic, you know, these kind of threats do have consequences. Um, I think judges, you know, would have to have superpowers not to have some some awareness of the consequences of these kind of comments. <clears throat> time. Campaign advertising. The ABA reports 39 states elect judges for their courts, either in partisan, nonpartisan, or retention elections. Now, most of them are fall into the latter category. I think there's only now less than a dozen states that have what we have here in Ohio, where it's straight out elections up and down the, the bench. Um, but so what does that mean? Look at some of the statistics. I found these pretty chilling. Um, 38 million spent on state Supreme Court elections in the 2009-2010 cycle. 70 million in the 2015-2016 cycle. And over the last four election cycles, spending by outside interest groups increased from 17.5% to 26.2 percent, to 30 percent, to 40 percent. Last November, 47 percent of the funding was from outside interest groups on our state court, Supreme Court elections. And what does that mean? What does that tell the public? Well, it tells the public that 95 percent of the public believe campaign spending does influence how judges rule on cases. 
that's a terrible um, perception to leave with the public. And it may be more than a perception. In some cases, it may be the reality. Um, very, very chilling. And this is usually the dark money. You know, we don't know who is contributing a lot of this money. But it's not coming from individual contributions. It's coming from um, PACs and other entities that have a very um, set agenda. And that, that, I think, is falls within a threat, um, at least in states where we elect our judges. So what are we supposed to do about all this? Well, for one thing, we as lawyers really do need to kind of step up and step up the game on this. Um, it's consistent with our professional obligations. We have a duty to further the public's understanding and confidence in the rule of law and the ju justice system. Um, you know, that's really, that's part of our ethical obligations. We have the same, the duty to maintain the fair and independent administration of justice. Lawyers are encouraged to continue traditional efforts to defend ju judges and courts unjustly criticized. So whether we do it through our bar associations or through public education, I think we do have a very um, definite role to play, not only to defend the judges, you know, it's sometimes it's easy to be complacent until there's an attack. And then there'll be a flurry of activity. There'll be letter to, letters to the editors or statements, you know, this is so wrong. But then we kind of step back and get complacent again. So um, we think we really do need a better system for educating the adult population about judicial independence and the need for fair and impartial courts. There are very good programs now in our schools, um, in particular the program that was sponsored by um, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. In the, the, up through the K-12, they are hearing this kind of civic education that gets lost. Um, but what about the adult population? When you, you think of um, you know, the voters and the, the other groups out there who are very concerned about elections, you have to, how do we educate them? How do we reach them to give them this kind of education that the judiciary really is different? Oops. Um, we need to be more proactive, and I think we need to be more expansive. You know, I, I think it's a great white paper. Our committee did a great job with it. But who's going to find it? You know, unless I come and hand it out, you, you never would have read it. The public's never going to read it. Mm -hmm. It's not enough for us to just write the papers or talk among the lawyers to go to CLE programs and bar associations activities to talk about this. We really do need to reach out to the, to the public and find a way to, to get this message across. Can I make a comment? Please. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very hard to believe in impartial judges when Republican judges are going to make decisions according to Republican principles. And I'm talking about Ohio. And Democratic judges are going to make decisions according to Democratic principles. I have to be a Republican, so I take my slate card in and I try to vote mm -hmm. for Republican judges. A lot of my friends don't care what party the judges are in, and they vote by other factors, which are very hard to find. Right. But uh, we do have a um, political system in Ohio, and judges are members of political parties, and they do rule by party principles, which they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. So. As long as we have this political system, what can we do about impartial judges? Right. Well, I, um, two thoughts on that, and then I'd, I'd love to hear from the audience. Um, I, you know, anecdotally, that might be a concern. Um, I, I would say, you know, judges running is unpartisan. You know, they they are elected that way. We hope when they get to the bench that they're not just voting on party lines. Um, and you know we don't have I don't think we have a study in Ohio that suggests one way or the other that would support that um, but it's important that you know what, what you're saying is when, when we have a partisan system like that they're just like any other politician they're just politicians in robes and that's that's unfortunate the bigger question is what can we do about it well 
you could have um, get rid of electing your judges. Um, a lot of states have done that, or at least gone to nonpartisan elections or retention elections. Um, you know, we've tried merit selection in Ohio at least twice that I've been aware of, and it goes down every time. We even have judges. Um, I believe in the you know our judges on our Supreme Court favor judicial elections. I'm sorry, you had a no. Yes, sir. Um, so I'm wondering about whether there are threats to judicial independence from judges themselves. And I'm thinking specifically about comments that come through in dissents that call into question the independence um, or the lawfulness of majority opinions um, that comes from. I would say both sides. Do um, you think there's some validity to that? I think there is. That's an excellent point. Um, you know, it's funny. Some of the most caustic comments in dissents come from the United States Supreme Court. I mean, they, they can be brutal on each other. Um, I don't think that's, you see some in, in our courts here, but I think that's, and I do think that's unfortunate. Um, and, and I think it also comes out in, in the campaigning. You know, these negative campaign ads. Now, particularly in the judiciary, I think they try to distance themselves, but you've seen some of the ads here in Ohio. I mean, they're just brutal what they will say about each other. Um, you know, the dark music and the bad picture and this judge, you know, supports child abusers because of a decision he or she wrote 20 years ago. I mean, yes, I think the judges are complicit sometimes. Um, and I think also that we are now starting to see more advocacy for judges coming out, not just the lawyers coming out. Um, in terms of judicial independence, but having the judges make a stand as well. You know, for years, the judges were kind of very meek and quiet. Oh, we're judges, we, do, we don't comment. Um, you know, that's not really right. I don't think that the canons, uh, the judicial canons prohibit a judge from commenting, on, maybe not on a pending case, certainly not, but, but talking about this generally. And, and I give credit to our Chief Justice. She's been very um, strong in terms of speaking out. She. Um, spoke out in defense of Justice Kennedy, who was criticized for some comments she made down in Cincinnati. She had an article in the, in the local paper just last month, I think, um, talking about the need for judges to come out and be more, more, more visible to the public, um, to speak out to public groups so they have a better understanding of what judges do. So yes, they've been complicit, but I think now they're opening up to being um, more supportive in taking a more active role. There's another uh, problem um, with our system here. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a quote about um, public involvement. Uh, but uh, so many people don't vote for judges. Terrible. In Ohio. It's like 20% drop off when you get down well, to the judges. Drop off rate, uh, actually, our administrative judge in the common place court here, Franklin County, there was a 34% drop off rate last year. Wow. But you know what the drop off rate was for uh, county commissioner and county auditor? 3%. Now, what does that tell you? Public is more interested in county commissioners and auditors and judges? Maybe. Right. Where they uh, know what they do and they don't know what judges do? <laughs> uh, that's part of, part of it. Um, part of it is that uh, they don't know what party the judge is in, and voters care, mm -hmm. like, like me. Mm -hmm. Voters do care what party they're in because they feel that Democratic judges are going to vote Democratic principles and Republican judges are going to vote, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, to decide cases on Republican principles. And they don't know which party and they don't know, have any other basis for deciding. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and in some states, they do mandate that you put on the party affiliation for the judges. I'm sorry. Some states do yeah, mandate that. Not in Ohio. Mm -mm. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fiction, you know. Mm -hmm. We require the judges to state that how they're going to decide cases on the bench. In right, they have to say that when they enter the primary. And they all enter the primary. Mm -hmm. Whether even if they're alone, they enter the primary. And they all sign a declaration of candidacy. And in that declaration it says, I pledge to vote, I'm sorry, I pledge to perform my job in accordance with the principles of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. 
I had not. I did not know that. It's in, it's in section um, thirty-five, thirteen, zero seven, form of declaration of candidacy and and petition. And is that statutory? Yeah, I further declare that if elected to said officer position, I will qualify therefore, and that I will support and abide by the principles enunciated by the blank party. And they all signed it. I was so not aware of that. Now that's. <laughs> um, it was kind of interesting. Um, you don't see this very often, but Judge Lynch publicly changed her party. I did see yeah. uh, that. To run as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, Judge Crawford did that. Du Judge Crawford did that years ago, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. And this was uh, January of 2019. I desire to be a candidate for nomination to the Office of Judge County Court of Common Police commencing 1 January 2nd, 2023, as a member of the Democratic Party at the next primary election. So we require them, in essence, to state what their party affiliation is, but we hide it from the voters. Why do we hide it from but, the voters? But what, what decisions are, is a common police judge making it's going to be different for a Republican or a Democrat. I don't know. I mean, a wide variety of, of possibilities. Wide variety. Mm -hmm. it, maybe they look at society differently. Maybe they'll mm -hmm. sentence uh, uh, criminal defendants right. differently. Uh, maybe Democrats will be more liberal than Republicans. Um, certainly, many Democrats view Republicans as more conservative. I, I don't know. I mean, society creates numerous conditions and situations that wind up in the courts and it's very difficult to say what decisions are going to be made differently but there must be a belief in our legislature and amongst society who would have a law like this that there's a difference there must be well, otherwise why do this mm -hmm. so you can keep score and sweep which team won <coughs> All I know is this is a this is a situation, and I think it's right. troubling to me that I'm not bothered by judges. If you're going to have a partisan election, which we have, okay, uh, and there are experts who say that's the best way to elect judges because judges will be responsive. The appointed judges, like federal judges, are not as responsive. You want they're not judges representative. Are responsible, yeah. responsive to the voters. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. My problem is hiding that from the voters under some fiction that, gee, if the voters don't know, uh, right. then uh, the judges will be less partial. Well, we're talking about, you're talking about responsive judges, and you're talking about independent, impartial judges. So we are at cross purposes with our conversation. I don't think so, because she's talking about impartial judges. Mm -hmm. And is a judge who is going to decide cases along Republican lines impartial? Is a judge who's going to decide cases according to Democratic principles? Is he impartial? I mean, we we saw mm -hmm. some criticism here of the fact that uh, uh, politics should not be involved with the judiciary. And there's an example in these are good materials, by the way. Discussion of the Canadian system. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, they're all appointed. Yeah, no election at all. No election. We had Canadians on our committee, and they were like, just kept saying, "What are you people talking about? We don't have that kind of problem." So, and the only factor that's different is they don't elect judges. Well, our royal judges. Or maybe they're just more civil our up royal in Canada. Judges, when we were colonies, were appointed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the British system still today, the judges are appointed, but we we thought it would be more democratic to elect them. I thought it was okay in Ohio until 1911 when we put in the nonpartisan ballot. That sort of so prior to then, it was known on the ballot, which oh, yeah. Well, prior to then, you had two things. Mm -hmm. You had them uh, running with open labels as Democrats or Republicans, and you had the slate ballot where you could vote straight tickets. Uh -huh. well, when they got rid of the slate ballot, then somebody thought these were the reform over movement uh, people of that era. Somebody thought that would be a great idea now just to take off the party label and have them run in our partisan. 
and that's what happened. So there was immediate, immediate drop in voting for judges. Interesting. <coughs> but if you look at the election of uh, 1910 compared to the election of 1912, there was like a 20 to 25 percent or 30 percent drop off. And that, that has been the case every year since then. Mm -hmm. So many people do not vote for judges. And, and I would submit to you that a large majority, maybe not a majority, but an awful lot of Ohio judges, you know, you talk about election versus appointment, but so many of them are initially appointed and then run as an incumbent that we have almost a de facto merit system without the merit. Uh, you know, most judges get appointed to vacancies by the governor and then they run as an incumbent with their right. party support, whereas the two efforts to have Merit selection of judges, which would say a judge gets appointed, serves a reasonable <coughs> amount of time, and then and then stands in a retention election, I think would be would much increase the independence and impartiality of the mm -hmm. judge. Mm -hmm. well, I support retention elections. <coughs> I wrote a book about it, but um, I've never heard of a Democratic governor appointing a Republican judge. Hmm. I've never, I've never heard a Republican governor appoint a Democratic judge. Right. right. So the fact that they're appointed doesn't mean that you know we're appointing the best. Well, I, I didn't mean to apply that. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that those who say, oh, we can't have merit selection of judges, we have to have them elected. I submit to you that a vast, a, a huge number of the current sitting bench was first appointed to the bench. Yeah. Certainly at the trial level. Yeah. Sure. You had a question. I was going to ask the gentleman in the front to repeat if he could cite that statute requiring judges to pledge allegiance to the party. <laughs> this is out. Visual aids. Other comments, questions? You don't need this back. Sir. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.